Uh, we're finishing up uh, week four of our series, but before I get that, I just encourage you to sign up for that worship class. It's in the back. It's not how to worship, like lift up your hands, do this, do that, speak in tongues, this and that. It's ways that we can worship found in scripture. So Sergio's excited to teach that class. Uh, it's seven weeks, it'll bring us right up to Thanksgiving. So we're excited about that. There'll also be a Pastor Jack class in the fellowship hall as well. One last note too, if you have it on your heart to donate to the food pantry, we need rice and instant potatoes. Rice and instant potatoes, amen? All right. So let's review. Week one of our series, we said this. We're going through value statements that we want to be found true of us as Christians and of our church. We are faith-filled, big-thinking, bet-the-farm risk-takers. We will never insult God with small thinking or safe living. Gone are the days of only saying grace and only praying safe prayers. God is a God of impossible. We sang it, nothing is impossible. But do you believe it? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Week number two, we said we are not spiritual consumers. Take, take, take. We are spiritual contributors. The church does not exist for us. We are the church and we exist for the world. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The disciples were concerned with consumption. Jesus was concerned with contribution. Last week, the most popular of the weeks, we talked about tithing. We will lead the way with a rational generosity. We will truly believe it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen? Come on, Pastor Jack's back. Amen? Amen. All right. So today we're going to conclude it with a fourth value that we'll talk about in a minute. It's a near and dear, it's probably my most favorite one of the four weeks. It's why I have a visual aid on the stage. We tried to hang it from the ceiling, but Pastor Erica was afraid of heights when I had her up there last night, so we did it there instead. That's where it landed, actually, so we left it there. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2 today. We're going to start at verse 17 and then backtrack to verse 1 a little bit later. So if you uh, want to get there, if you need a Bible, one of our handy dandy ushers would hand you a Bible. If you need a Bible, just let us know. If you don't want to lift your hands up, you can slide to the back. They'll give you a Bible. Just to give you a little background on Mark and this chapter here. Jesus had just called a guy named Levi who was a tax collector. And when we say tax collector today, we don't really understand what people felt about tax collectors. They were evil people, they were deceitful people, they were wicked people, nobody liked the tax collectors. They were associated with all the worst people. And Jesus had led him into the kingdom of God. And then this guy, who was very, very excited to share what just happened, decided to throw a party. And what did he do when he threw a party? He didn't invite all the people that he just met from church. He invited all of his friends, which happened to be other sinners. Can you believe it? The disciples were part of the party too. They were there with Jesus. But the religious people of the day saw this happening and they saw that Jesus was there, and their response was, how could Jesus sit with prostitutes and sinners? Sometimes the religious people like to add extra syllables to their words. But right away, how could Jesus be with those sinners, those evil people? Jesus' response kind of broke rules in and of itself by what he said. And it was controversial, almost heretical in their minds. This is what he said in chapter 2, verse 17. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. That is who Jesus died on the cross for. That is why this church exists. That's why salvation exists. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. 
Thank you for this opportunity to share the gospel. We pray that you'll bless the kids downstairs during this time. Bless our hearts and be with the Portuguese up next. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus didn't come for the people that have it all together like you guys. We all have it together. We're all perfect. He didn't come for them. My calling in life was birthed out of the need to help other people. But I grew up in the church. And my calling was when I was on the mission field and I saw that there were people that need Jesus in another country. So I felt called onto the mission field. I grew up in New Hampshire in the Rochester area where Paula and James are right now, which we miss, but they're having a good vacation. But my calling was to reach the lost and the hurting. But I really didn't get hit with those that are down and out and the real sinners until I find myself running from God and ending up in prison. It was then when I was in prison and was the sinner, was the unrighteous, was the destitute that I started to see and God opened my eyes more and more of the hurting people, the, the felons, those that no one else could love. And it broke my heart even more. We sing it all the time, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. But do you really walk around the city with a broken heart? Because that hurts. I found my, my biological brother later on in life. He happened to be a heroin addict on the streets of a, a town that I was working in at a church. Tell me God doesn't have a plan. It was odd, but that's where I found him. I was able to lead him to the Lord, bring him to Teen Challenge, but he kept running and he kept running and he kept running, and he died of an overdose on his toilet. Broke my heart that I couldn't even help my brother. At least that's what I thought. I did everything I could. I led him to the Lord. I helped him. I gave him money over and over again in the right way. But he still passed away. So now when I walk around our city and I see the needles and I see the people nodding out because you know that they're on drugs, I don't judge them. I want to help them. And that's exactly what Jesus would do. If that's not your heart, you need to check your spirit. You need to do the John Chris song, Check Your Heart. If you don't know John Chris, it's a good song. Let's go back. Mark chapter 2, starting with what? verse 1. We're going to read through it real quick, and then we're going to dive into it. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Notice that Jesus took care of his spiritual situation and then he took care of his physical situation. A value that I hold near and dear to my heart is we will do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. To reach people no one is doing, we will do things that no one else is doing. As we've done the last four weeks, I'm going to put a, a, a thing on the screen to check your heart. Where is your love for people without Christ? It's a scale from one to ten. Make sure I put it. If you're on the one side, you're apathetic. We're just going to call it. When you see people on the street, you don't care if they go to hell. That's number one. Number ten, nobody here unless Billy Graham is here. You can be close, but nobody's a ten. Check your heart. Where are you on that scale? In the last seven days, we'll, we'll be more generous. In the last month, 30 days, have you led someone to the Lord? Have you prayed for people to come to salvation? Have you brought someone to church? You're going to be in the seven, eight, nine category. 
If you've never led someone to the Lord, if you rarely ever bring someone to church, if you're not praying for someone to come to the Lord, you're probably going to be on the this, this, this shorter side. One, two, or three. What do your actions say about your belief? You can profess it. You can sing it every Sunday morning. But when you walk out that door onto Rock Street, if your actions don't back it up, it's as filthy rags. It's worthless. These guys heard that Jesus was in town. The, story, the scripture doesn't give a lot of detail about these four people. Maybe they were four strangers. Maybe it was their friend. It's irrelevant to the story. But they cared enough to say, Jesus is in town, and we want to bring you to him. We don't know how far it was, if it was a short distance or a long distance. But unless it's somebody like a Jonathan, which, you know, we can lift them up. You know, what if it was somebody like me or Ron? It took four guys to carry this guy across town to bring to Jesus. Some of us have a hard enough time just texting someone, hey, you want to come to church? Never mind, picking them up and bringing them across town. I think so many times as Christians, we want to simply do drive-by evangelism. We drive down the street, mar, mar, Jesus loves you. We don't want to get down and dirty. We don't want to talk and have a conversation because we're human and we don't want to be rejected. But guess who was rejected the most, right? Jesus. And he did it anyways. He knew that that was going to happen. He knew the pain and anguish, but he still did it. Yet some of us can't even ask people to come to church. And it's not about our church. It's about the capital C church, the big church. Reaching people with the love of Christ We've talked about it the last four or five weeks. Love God, the greatest commandment, followed by love people. If you do those two things, you're going to change your life, change your world, change your city, change the church. Pastor Jack has talked about for the last, I've been here five years, and I think it was right around five years ago that the Lord showed you the hub of Christianity idea. So how does a church become the hub of Christianity? By loving God. Loving people, changing your city. Then you can become a hub of something. You can't just instantly become it. You have to do those things. We can't just get that title. We have to believe that there's a process in that. You look at the, the football games, the baseball games. Up goes the banner, John 3.16. I did my witnessing for the week. Is that how you witness? Or the bumper sticker on the back of your car as you cut someone off and wave the thumbs up? How are you sharing your love of Christ throughout the week? It can be simple. Listen, you can't proselytize. You can't, if, if you work at Market Basket or different places, you can't be, hey, can I tell you about the good name of Jesus as you're scanning your things? A lot of employers frown on that. But you know what you can do? Smile. Hey, how's your day today? Oh, you're having a bad day? I'm so sorry to hear that. You're going to stand out from the crowd because you go, not to Market Basket, because we know Market Basket's the best. But if you go, let's say, to like Shaw's or Stop and Shop, there are grumpy people at those things. They don't even want to look at you. But you can stand out that there's something different by simply smiling. Because that smile then also can lead to try something different about you, bro. Then he could say, hey, let me tell you about my church. No, let me tell you about my Jesus. That made a difference in my life. And then I could just happen to tell you that I go to this great church. But if you're in Dartmouth, there's another great church. It's good to have Timmy and Cassandra here today too. So how do we do that? If you are a believer this morning, you can't just want people to come to the Lord. You've got to really, really want it. 
The first thing you need to do is bear some burdens. We've talked about it over. There's a, there's a pattern for the last four weeks. You have to bear someone else's burdens. Mark 2, 3 says, some, main, some men come to Jesus. They brought a paralyzed man. They carried by four of them. We have to bear other people's burdens. We don't just invite people. We bring people. People don't care about how much you know. They want to know how much you care about them. Oftentimes, of course, no one in this church would do this. But you're like, hey, bro, I'll pray for you this week. Then the next week comes and you see him come and you're like, oh, dear Lord, please be with Trot. Hey, Trot, I prayed for you this week. But how many of you go home, Thursday night we had a great Bible study and people were sharing what was on their heart. How many of you went home and prayed for those individuals? Don't show your hands. But I know some of you did because you've reached out to the other individuals. Some of you that night walked right over to somebody that shared a prayer request and you laid hands and you prayed for them. You told them about job openings. You cared. You were bearing his burden. Throughout the week you've reached out to him and other people. Our actions need to show the love of Jesus. There's people in need, there's visitors, there's people on the streets that need Jesus. These four guys, they brought them to Jesus. And they got to the house, but there was no room to get into the house. They could have just given up then. Left them outside. Yo, you okay? All right. But they didn't. They got up and they tried to figure out what can we do? They looked around and they said, hey, there's Jonathan coming across the stage. You guys thought it was part of the, the skit, right? But they could have. Just think about it. All these people. So when they get there, the door of the house is there. They could just see the backs of people listening to Jesus preach. Pre Jesus was probably preaching such a great message. You know, if it was today, they'd pull it out there for, oh, I got to tweet that. Oh, yes, amen, Jesus. But the people that were there, they didn't care about the people on the outside. Sometimes I think we come to church on Sunday mornings and we're here worshiping in the first, the holy pews up here. You know, move forward, move forward. But we're worshiping God, but we don't care about the unsaved, the people that came in behind us. We don't care about the people outside. We don't even care if they go to hell. I know that's nobody's heart, but it's a lot of our actions or lack of actions that are saying we don't care if you are going to hell. How can we care about somebody's burden if we're not there? If they're hurting, will you listen to them? If they're having a baby, will you go visit with them? If their mother or father dies, will you go to the funeral with them? Text them. If they're sick or had surgery, will you make meals for them? Praise God, that's happening in this church. And so are some of those other things. This isn't a message of condemnation. It's a message of opening your eyes to what you're doing, and hopefully you're desiring to do just a little bit more. Because Christ the Rock is out on the streets. We are doing things, but we could do just a little bit more. There's a story that I heard of of this girl named Amber. She was a real estate agent. And she was all excited because from one interaction with this couple, she was getting three commissions. And in the real estate world, that's huge. So the situation was, it was a husband and wife, they were getting divorced. So she was selling both of their houses. And then, no, she was selling their house and then buying two houses for each of them. So that's three commissions. As she started to hear their story, her heart broke for what was happening. So she decided to give them a book on marriage, bring them to church, and pray over their lives. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, why would you pray for that? You're going to get three commissions on three big houses. The situation led to the marriage was restored, praise God. But guess what she lost? Three commissions. But she didn't care because her vision for what God wanted her to do was more important than her pocketbook or wallet. 
The week after, she got three contracts that were even bigger than the ones she would have had. So God was faithful. But what would you have done in that situation? Something to think about. How will that play out here with you guys or with us in the church? If you have eyes to see and you're willing to see it, I guarantee God will show you what you should do. It could be as simple as like when Daniel gave away his taco. Or it could be somebody that popped in the office this week and gave me 20 bucks and said, the next time you go on a walk, get some gift cards and give this away. It could be something bigger. It could be something smaller. It could be something like bringing, inviting somebody to come to church and then bringing them with you. Whether you're at work, school, on the streets, we need to bear others' burdens. The second thing I see in this story, some of you might get excited about this. Sometimes you have to break some rules. The kids are all dismissed, so they're not going to hear this part. Teenagers, no breaking rules. But when I say breaking rules, it's a little bit different than you're thinking. But I have to admit, as a kid, I never waited 30 minutes before I went swimming after I ate. I sniffed magic markers. I didn't always wear my seatbelt. My mother was my seatbelt. Whoosh! I did run with scissors. I still do that. Connie's always yelling at me to stop running around the office with scissors. I speed sometimes, never in Pastor Jack's car, unless I'm late to the airport. These four guys broke some rules. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the mat the man was on. Doing a little research, the roofs back then were made with three-foot beams spread apart. They were covered with thatch, mud, manure, and hay to make a, a conglomerate of stuff. These guys climbed up on that roof. They were so determined to not just bring this guy to church, but bring him into Jesus, they started to dig through it. Manure. Do I have to explain it more? They were willing to get their hands dirty to bring this guy for his miracle. Some of us can't even invite someone to church on Facebook. These guys got dirt and manure under their fingernails. My prayer is that you guys, that we are willing to get our hands dirty for the kingdom of God. That might mean shaking hands with somebody that you don't think you should shake hands with. That might mean hugging somebody that makes you go as you're hugging them. Because it's just a reaction. It's not your heart, but it happens. It might mean putting someone in your car and driving them to a hotel. This week, I, I shared this on Thursday night. Carla, she's not here this morning, but she works for social services in the city. And her heart broke that her service couldn't do a lot for these people. It was a husband, wife, and a six-month baby girl. They were homeless in the city. She's like, Pastor Rob, I don't know what to do. Is there anything you can do? It's like, I don't know. So I'm trying to think, what can we do? So I said, well, tell them they can come by. I have Hot Pockets. There's Hot Pockets in the fridge. Uh, my son ate them this summer. I can microwave a bunch of Hot Pockets. So at least that. So they got here. We put them in the nursery. They, they, they were just, they were so hesitant. They're like, we've been in this city for days and nobody wanted to help us. Somehow God led us to Carla and Carla led us to you. I said, well, let me give you some Hot Pockets. And then I ran around the church trying to find stuff. Thank goodness Pastor Erica was already on her way here because I love doing ministry with my wife. Amen. So she gets here, we kind of brainstorm. Then I remember, well, they've been trying to call this number all day, the DHCP, I don't know, some number. And they kept calling, and they kept getting hung up on. So I called first step in. No, we don't take anybody with kids. Well, where are these people supposed to sleep tonight? The night before, they slept at Turner Park. I thought of you because of Turner Park. They slept in Turner Park with their little baby girl. My heart broke, not just because I have a heart for outreach, 
but because my little grandbaby, that could be my grandbaby. So I'm like, what else can we do? The shelters all said they couldn't take them. So I remembered. The mayor came here once, gave me his number. So it started a long process. Long story short, because this church has helped the city so much, we had a little leverage to be like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And they got him into a hotel for the night, praise God. And then the next day, as far as I know, they got a hold of the, and got into the system. But if I didn't have a heart for that, if Carla didn't have a heart for that, those people would have just been passed over because they told me different churches in the city that I won't say that said, oh, sorry, there's nothing we can do. Yes, will there be days that there's nothing we can do? Because I can't keep pulling out the church credit card and be like, all right, here's a hotel, here's a hotel, here's a hotel. Just for clarification, I didn't do that. We did buy them dinner, though. We did feed them lunch. We did give them toiletries and stuff that we have here. Why do we have all that? Because of last week's message, generosity. Because some of you have given above and beyond. We have that stuff. These guys were willing to get their hands dirty. The reason I had gone into that story was because when we drove them to the hotel, the car smelt. It just did. They had been living on the streets. They didn't have showers. They didn't have this. Great people. We met a physical need through the help of the city, but then we talked about a spiritual need. We said, can we pray with you? They were both kind of like, uh. I waited till they were out of the car so it wasn't a hostage situation. I said, because they could have said no and just walked in. They said, yes, please pray for us. Prayed for them, left the church's phone number if you guys need anything, let's connect. Haven't heard from them again, but I'm hoping we do eventually. These four guys were willing to break rules, get their hands dirty for the kingdom of God. I can imagine in the situation where the, the guy who owned the house was probably looking up and seeing his roof start getting separated. And, and, but I'm sure Jesus took care of the situation. We don't know everything that happened outside of the narrative. But if the guy cared enough to have Jesus in his house, he probably had the right heart. We say anything short of sin because obviously we can't sin to bring people. The ends don't justify the means. But there are things that we can do as individuals and as people that can bring people to God. As a church, we give away water, we give away snacks, we give away turkeys, we give away gift cards, we give away blankets. Why do we do that? There's not a whole lot of churches that do that, and it doesn't make sense in a post-COVID society to spend that kind of money. But because it plants seeds, it meets needs, and people will come to the kingdom of God because of that. What else can we do? I believe as a church that we should be creative and innovative. If we want to reach people that nobody's reaching, we have to do things that nobody else is doing. Well, what is it? I don't know. But I want to be open to the Holy Spirit. What can we do? Lord, show us how to do something. If we go back 100 years, the church was the epicenter of creativity. The church drove the arts. The center of the city was artsy and this, that, and the other. We led the way with cultural influence. Like I preached before, we need to stop going to church and be the church. What organization should be better equipped to get the word out than the church? What organization should be better equipped to meet the needs in the community than the church? We talked about the book of Acts last week where nobody needed or wanted anything because they worked together. Nowadays, we've delegated our innovation to Apple. We handed off our creativity to the Hollywood. We've allowed the government to meet the needs of the poor. We surrendered relationships to Facebook instead of being creative. The church should be the answer. We want to, we have to. Why? Love God, love people. It's not just who we are, it's what we are. We are the light of the world. Real quickly, because time is slipping away. There were four other things I saw in the book, in this story. The first thing was they did it with teamwork. It wasn't just one person bringing someone to church. 
It was four of them. There's power in the idea that we can work together as a team. It's not just meant for one pastor, two pastors, three pastors. It's meant for us collectively as a church to meet the needs of this community. The truth is people rarely come to Jesus by themselves. Some people plant, some people water, some people will reap the harvest. But we all, whether we're a Sunday school teacher, Sunday school helper, nursery teacher, usher, pastor, hospitality person, we all water and plant seeds just simply by working and volunteering here at the church. Teamwork. When your efforts, if you think your efforts go unnoticed by others, rest assured that you, will still, you are still part of the team doing critical work. The second thing they had was tenacity. Since they could not get to him, Jesus, because of the crowd, they could have given up there. We talked about that. It could have seemed discouraging that they couldn't do it. But these men did not quit. They were determined like the woman that pushed through the crowd. If I could just touch the hem of his garments, she could have given up. But it was her faith. She pushed through, pushed through until she touched it. These men were determined... They could have given up any step of the way. Often as Christians, we do. We'll say, well, we did our best, but I guess it just wasn't enough. Maybe it's just not the right time. Maybe I'm not the right man for the job. Or it looks like God simply closed the door. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul writes, Because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me, Paul was saying that there was an opportunity, but he had opposition. Just because you reach opposition doesn't mean that that's a closed door. Sometimes you need to pray a little harder, try a little harder, press and push. Notice that open doors and opposition can go hand in hand. Obstacles do not necessarily mean that a door is closed. Sometimes you just have to push a little harder. There is not a single thing worth accomplishing for the kingdom of God without the possibility of facing difficulty, opposition, hardship, or setback. Five weeks ago, I asked you guys to start praying because I said our church has been under spiritual attack. Some of you have told me that we've been fasting and praying, and in turn, you've been under spiritual attack. There's no coincidence there. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities. So as some of you have started to stand in the gap for your church, you have been attacked. But what are you going to do now? Back down? Oh, I'm going to stop praying. Yo, no, you got to pray that much harder. Well, Pastor Rob, I'm not getting the answers. Then maybe we need to start baby steps and doing the fasting. Some of you have been fasting. I was talking about what we could possibly do in January about fasting as a church. And someone's like, well, I wouldn't call us to a 21-day Daniel fast because if they've never fasted, we're going to have people passing out. I said, I get that. But we need to understand the idea and the act of fasting is just sacrificing something. Pastor Erica, what is it? Every November gives up coffee. Now, that's crazy. Who gives up coffee? But she gives up coffee as an act of sacrifice for missions and fasting. You can give up almost anything for it. It doesn't have to be food. But there's act, there's power in it. So if you're not seeing the breakthrough that you need in your situation, add fasting to it. Because there were situations in the Bible where the disciples said, God, nothing is happening. And he said, but by prayer and fasting, sometimes it doesn't. We talked about tithing, being obedient, fasting, praying, worshiping, doing things together. Thank you for those that have started to fast and pray. And I ask that you continue to have the tenacity to not stop. Keep going. Because you're going to be raising your hand on another Thursday night like, I have a testimony. God did this. God did this. And what happens when we share the testimony? All of our collective faiths get built. Noah had his critics. Abraham faced the impossibility of conceiving a child in old age. Moses led stubborn people. Joshua had a land full of enemies and giants. David spent years running from Saul. Elijah dealt with threats of King Ahab and Jezebel. Nehemiah faced opposition when he was building the wall. Jesus had his Gethsemane. Paul was beaten, stoned, and shipwrecked. 
It's a spiritual battle to bring people to the Lord. But you have to be willing to do it. The enemy of our souls will stop at nothing in order to dissuade you from the task. It will take tenacity to overcome it. The third thing we see is tactics. They made an opening in the roof to get to Jesus. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines tenacity as this. The art or skill of employing available means to accomplish an end. These men didn't change the goal for something less. They had a goal to get him to Jesus. So they planned, how can we do this? I believe the greatest strategy killer in any church today is it's never been done in our church before. Guess what? No man had probably ever been brought to Jesus through a roof before until it happened. When I preached my series, When Pigs Fly, I said it only seems impossible until it actually happens. But it worked. They went through the roof. Praise the Lord that he is a God of new things. In scripture we read about new songs, new mercies, new creations, new heaven, new earth, new names, new wineskins. Neither the message of the gospel nor the goal of reaching the lost should ever change. But sometimes the strategies to do that will change. The fourth and final thing we see is trust. They had trust in this situation. And when Jesus saw their faith, Mark 2.5 says that. Now remember, when Jesus was in that situation, Jesus can read the heart, but it says he saw their faith because it was their actions to not just leave him outside the door, but to go up on the roof, to break the roof and bring them down. Jesus saw their faith. And the guy was healed. Who do you surround yourself with? Are you surrounding yourself with three or four people that have that kind of faith? Because those people helped dude get healed. Jesus saw their faith through action. Faith without works is dead. The Bible says don't just be hearers of the word but doers. What are you doing to further the gospel? Not further this church, but to further the gospel. Because if all of us love God, love people, and try to further the gospel, the church will naturally just grow. It's not about pushing our agenda. It's about pushing God's agenda, his love. James 2.18 says, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. It was Abraham's faith in action that rescued Lot. Paul's faith saved a shipwrecked crew. Do you have faith for those lost around you in your own life, in your own family, in your community? Back to week one. Would God be amazed at your giant faith? Or would he be amazed at your lack of faith? The two times God was amazed, great faith and lack of faith. And I pray that he's amazed at our great faith, not our lack of faith. As we close, I see a church full of people who don't judge those without Christ, but love them to Christ. A church full of people that say Jesus didn't come for the healthy, the sick, the righteous, but he came for the sinners. I see a church full of people who bear the burdens and are willing to break some rules. I see a church willing to do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. Who do you know that needs Jesus today? We are not doing it as a church unless you're doing it because collectively we are a church. As we stand to close, if we can all just close our eyes, bow our heads, I want you to think of someone in your life that needs the love of Jesus. Somebody who's miserably lost. Somebody who's maybe turned their back on him. Think about that person. Maybe the person you drive by on the city streets. Maybe someone at work that's just miserable every day. 
Have you prayed for them lately? I'm giving you 30 seconds right now. You can pray for them. Pray for them. Call them out by name. Ask God if he wants you to fast for them, to believe that God would bring them to him. Thank God for helping them in their situation. Thank God in advance for bringing them. Invite people to come to church. We have men's ministry Tuesday night. It's a non-threatening situation where you can invite other men to come to church, have a slice of pizza, and hang out with other brothers. Women's ministry, same thing. Ignite, same thing. Thursday night Bible study, same thing. Invite people. Then don't just invite them, bring them. Can I pick you up? We have a van, they'd be happy to pick you up. We have a van driver for Thursday nights to bring in the students and the youth. Ask God this morning, Lord, do I have a heart after you to love people? If there's nobody here this morning that if you've never accepted the Lord as your personal savior, maybe you don't understand this, you're like, I just need that love of God. I want to give you that opportunity right now. If you don't know Jesus and you want him as your personal savior, just slip up your hand, we'll pray with you. We'll introduce you to our Lord and Savior, the big boss, why we do all this. Or maybe you're in a situation where you're not where you need to be. You need to recommit your life to the Lord. Now is the time. The time is short. You can't say next Sunday I'll get right because you don't know what will happen. Now is the time to recommit your life to the Lord. Just say, Lord, come back into my life. Help me to press in and want more of you. For the Christians this morning that are going through it, maybe you're the person that's sitting on that, that stretcher and you just, you're needing friends to bring you to Jesus. You're not alone. Listen, I'm here for you. Reach out to any of the pastors we're here. If you need prayer, come up to the altar after. But if you want Jesus enough, it says, when you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me and you won't be disappointed. You can do that alone in your bed at night. You can cry out to Jesus. You can do that now. Father God, I lift up your church before you, God. I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Those that are going through tough situations, I pray that you'll give them breakthrough today, give them peace today. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Yahweh, I pray right now that you would find victory in him today. Lord, I pray those that need healing and a touch mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, Lord, that you would be made real in those situations today. Those that need jobs, you would find the perfect job for them this week. Those that need financial breakthrough, those that need restoration, those that need deliverance, God, that the power of God would be real today in this church and in your people. Thank you for this series, God. Pray that we will seal it in our heart, God, that we will love you, love people, God. Lord, be with our Portuguese as they come up next. Lord, bless their service. Let them have a fresh move. Be with the worship team as they help out in that service too. Bless the fellowship downstairs. Bring us all back on Thursday night for Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, this pastor loves you. Go downstairs, have some coffee. If you need prayer, I'm up here to pray with you. Love you guys.